Like I, I like InfiniBand, like I set up InfiniBand at home and stuff, so also if anybody wants InfiniBand knowledge, I'm a person you can ask about that as well. If you want to do it really cheaply, I can show you on eBay how to do that, so it's all good. Um, the agenda for this, we're going to describe the Gluster a bit, um, the difference between a traditional file system and how Gluster, being a distributed file system, does stuff. Um, show a bit about how it's the logic, redundancy and fault tolerance, which is important in any kind of file system. How you actually do data access, um, the general administration, you know, some of the actual command line commands, and some of the use cases, like some of the biggest, you know, provide, uh, biggest users of Gluster, things like NASA, Pandora, this sort of thing. Um, so, if I talk too fast or too slow, I'm an interactive presenter. So you can say, hey, dude, slow the hell up. You know, that makes sense. And if I'm talking t with too much of an Australian accent, or if I don't swear enough, or if I swear too much, which I do a lot, <laughs> okay, I'm a sysadmin, right? Um, you can correct me and ask questions and stuff as we go. Okay, is that cool? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, and yeah, you can do things like this and this and whatever else suits. It's, it's all good. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, the sys angry sysadmin was a story from after I wrote a blog post about SourceForge. I was slagging them off for bundling spyware, and so that was when the sys angry sysadmin thing came up. Nothing to do with this talk unless you piss me off. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Now, so what is GlusterFS? Gluster is a POSIX-like distributed file system. Uh, what that means is, instead of having a, having a file system on a single individual server, that actually, um, mic check. Mark, can you hear me? Sorry? <laughs> is, the mi is the mic out loud enough? I, I right, so. Just, <laughs> so, sorry, quick, should have done that a second ago. Okay, so... Awesome. So I need to speak into that. Yeah. Speak into the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. I can't now see my laptop. Awesome. <laughs> okay, I don't... Yeah, yeah, don't touch it. <laughs> okay, if I speak like this, can you guys hear me at the back? Is it accept acceptable level? Sweet. Okay, I'll just do it like that and it's all good. It looks like an oral B anyway. Okay. <laughs> it does. It looks like a <laughs> Slight technical hiccup. Okay, so Gluster is a distributed POSIX-like file system. Uh, a traditional file system, you have your server and you have one server and if anything goes wrong with it, you're screwed, basically. You know, you have to go to a backup or something like that. A distributed file system uses a bunch of servers um, so that you have, you know, better throughput of data, so that you have redundancy. If one of them gets lost, the files that we're trying to access that would traditionally be on a single file system can be gotten from a number of, of different servers so that you automatically and seamlessly have, you know, redundancy. Um, Failover is just all, you know, transparent. It just all works. That's the theory. You know, reality is sometimes a bit more different for everything, but in general, this is how things work. Um, when it's POSIX-like, it means that if you've got an application that works with the normal files, it will work with Gluster. It's just standards-based type of file access. Uh, no metadata server. This is a, a, a fairly important point for scale-out storage. For many distributed file systems, you have a central server that has metadata about all the files that you're trying to access. And as a site gets really, really big, that central server, this metadata server, it becomes a real failover point. Uh, things like uh, Ceph and GlusterFS have ways to deal with this kind of problem, as Gluster has its own way of dealing with this kind of problem. Gluster uses a different approach and um, spreads it spreads its files according to like an algorithm, so that there's no central lookup sort of place, uh, which works pretty well. Um, it's network attached storage, so it's like a filer, like a NetApp filer type of thing. I say type of thing because the concept's similar-ish. You know, your files are on a remote sort of thing. Um, I'll explain that better later. <laughs> so. 
One of the important points with Gloucester is you don't need high-end, high expensive hardware. You don't need to go and spend $200,000 on a super high redundancy central server. Uh, you don't need to go spend a, you know, a smeg load on, you know, okay, I'm trying to get better with the squaring, right? <laughs> um, smeg load's British, right? Anyway, um, you know, Red Dwarf, anyway. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so you don't need to spend a, a huge amount on massively expensive hardware like your, uh, your sand type of gear or anything like that. You use cheap off-the-shelf components, you use them in abundance so that you can spend a, you know, a quarter or a fraction of the amount of money on many servers and they're each redundant and you know, take over when another one fails. Uh, there are ways of striping the data across them all so that you get you know, um, data from all of them at once rather than just one being a redundant for the other. We'll get into that later. Um, aggregate sh uh, storage and memory, uh, we'll get onto that later. Standards based. So, Gluster can be accessed via things like uh, NFS. If you happen to be using NFS servers, you can drop Gluster in, in place. Um, change your mount points and it'll pick up the Gluster servers as well and have you know, the redundancy and stuff uh, in the back end. Um, flexible and agile scaling you know, capacity, petabytes and beyond, thousands of clients. Uh, some places in America we've got pushing about 60 gigabytes a second of data, not gigabits, gigabytes, and like that's out of 100 nodes to you know, a couple of thousand clients. Um, so it, it can scale up, but that's yeah, it takes work to do that, don't get me wrong. When you start scaling any system past a certain amount, you've got to really think about the design and do stuff. But Gluster's made to be easy to use, whereas most of the other high-performance ones are, you know, you need a full-time sysadmin to use this stuff. Whereas Gluster's made to drop it in, it works, and you can do it without needing a full-time sysadmin. It just generally works. Um, and a single global namespace, meaning that when you've got Gluster set up, um, out of the box, the way that it works is that if your client can see the files on the server, all of the other clients can see all the files on the server. It's like a, a shared sort of volume. Um, we'll get into that more later as well. Uh, so this is the short version of saying it's really good. Yeah. <laughs> Look, it, it doesn't fit all use cases either. Don't get me wrong. It's like it's good for its a large amount of use cases, but don't try and use it for some stuff that you know, I'll show you later. If you've got like a news server with tons and tons and tons of small files, Gluster is not the solution you want. It'll, you know, it's not, it, it will die in the ass if you try and use it for that. It, it hates tons of small files. Um, yeah, so Gluster versus traditional solutions. Who here has used uh, NetApp filers before? Okay, so yeah, people that know exactly, you know. NetApp have very, very good solutions. I happen to like their solutions, they're as expensive as hell. And you know, if I was a NetApp salesperson, I think that'd be great. But as a you know, person that's tried to use and buy NetApp stuff before, it's you know, a bit of a problem. Um, Gluster is the whole cheap ass commodity hardware. You put it together, you set it up, and it gets similar performance out of it, um, except for the small file use case. Sand is costly, like, uh, you know, if you're an EMC, that's a good thing. If you're anybody else, like a customer, not so good. Um, uh, yeah, now, GlusterFS linear scaling. The more servers that you add, the more throughput you get from the, the entire result. If you do, like, a bef uh, performance benchmarking or whatever with two servers and think, oh, that's sort of like, you know, it's okay performance. If you then scale that out to 10 servers, you get five times the performance because you've got five times as many servers. So you can really sort of balance out how much throughput you want at a, you know, to the end clients from the amount of servers and seeing as individual servers themselves are not that expensive. I mean, you know, you can put together a basic, you know, server class hardware for like, you know, two or three grand, like super basic, chuck a bunch of disks in it, you know, you can do that quite a few times for like less than 10 or 15 grand. Uh, if you want to go really commodity, you can do that for a fraction of that even. Um, and it technically works, but you need to, you know, justify and balance and that it, as, as it goes. Um, minimal overhead, high redundancy, yeah, just keep adding more servers and you're good. Simpler, inexpensive deployment. Some organizations it doesn't work like inexpensive because you need to actually plan everything out and change control makes even putting a USB key into something expensive. So. In general, it's inexpensive deployment. The technology stack. Okay. I should have really put a picture here, hey? 
Uh, warning, there's not many pictures in this. I talk with my hands. So, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, yeah, it's just, just me. Um, so, in the Gloucester world, you have your server and you have bricks. Bricks are, the easiest way to think about is a disk. Now, um, you can screw with that concept and do things differently, but for the base part, a brick is a disk. So, you've got a brick, a file system mount point, so you've put your, your, your bricks into a server. Let's say you've got four bricks and you put them together into a volume. Cool? Yep, cool, all good. I'm, just, I'm looking for nods, yeah, yeah, okay. This is a basic, <laughs> you know. I, I look at people and try to connect to them to make sure that, that you know, that they're getting what I'm saying, you know. Um, now, a special, uh, is the special way that Gluster does stuff. Gluster uses a concept of translators for everything. So, any type of brick that you assemble into a volume across a whole bunch of servers, the way that it works is you have these things called translators in your Gluster server and when you define a volume out of the bricks, you the, it's the translators which um, go from the whole volume concept into where your data is going. So you have like a translator which says, okay, I'm going to distribute the data across several servers. So that's like a distributed translator. There's, there's like a replica translator which, um, you know, makes replicas across servers instead of distributing files out. There's read ahead translators for like performance enhancement. There's all kinds of stuff. Out of the box, we provide a whole bunch of simple defaults, like you know, a distributed one, like a replica one, these sorts of things. You can get funky if you decide to go down that route and go, I think if we have a like a left wing thing here, right, you know, you can you can make your own type of volumes out of all these different bits if you so want. So the concept of translator is like a pluggable module that does stuff, and you can plug them on top of each other. They don't, it's not just one or the other. You can combine a replica translator with a, distribu with a distribu distribution translator um, with all kinds of other things. So if you have a volume made up of two bricks here from this server and two bricks here from this server, you know, that's a, let's say, a replica translator. You can add another translator to distribute that. So it would have two here, two here, uh, let's say two here and two here. Okay, I'm describing that badly, but you sort of get the concept of pluggable. Yeah, cool. <laughs> okay. Okay, so volumes here yeah, is what the bricks get made of. Nodes and peers. So this is your servers. A node is a server. A peer is another server next to it. So if you've got like your server here, its peers are the ones over there. It's a pretty standard sysadmin sort of concept, so I'm going to assume we've all got that, yeah? Cool. Um, Foundation components, yeah, yeah, commodity, commodity boxes, and you can you look. You don't have to actually have your own servers. You just need something that runs an OS and has storage attached to it. So you can whip up a Gluster instance on EBS. I mean, on Amazon, and do stuff with that. And it does work. Uh, some people do a lot of stuff with that. Pff, I don't happen to like the personally the Amazon environment that much. But hey, look, that's just me, you know. Um, disks and file systems. Contrary to what I said before about not needing a huge ass expensive piece of gear, the Red Hat way of doing stuff, specifically Red Hat not upstream community way, is they say, okay, if you're going to deploy Gluster, you might as well put it on at least a moderately expensive hardware RAID controller so that if something fails, you know, it's just automatic in this, you know, in the, the hardware does it itself and you don't have to think about re-replicating information across servers up to you. A lot of our the upstr upstream Gluster community doesn't do that, you know, it's, you know, each to their own. If you've got a, like a limited budget, you don't. If you want to spend a grand on a hardware RAID controller that you think helps, go nuts, you know. And, and Red Hat's like got its very specific guidelines for stuff and they're made for like, you know, enterprise business. But, you know, w find out what works for you. Um, logical uh, LVM and XFS. Who here has used XFS before? Yep. So XFS is a file system generally used on large-scale storage. Uh, most everyone here is going to be familiar with stuff like X, uh, X3 or X4 file system. XFS is what you want to be using for using Gluster. Um, it does things slightly differently than X3 or X4. From a user's perspective, you won't really know much difference. You know, you, you form it as one way, you just do stuff and it just works. It's, there's no huge difference. 
XFS does file attributes differently and has less bugs at large scale. So that's why, well, it's the easiest way to, you know, to say it. But this is why we recommend XFS, <laughs> you know, <laughs> without showing you bugzilla numbers, this is the easy way to say it, less bugs at large scale. So when you make big ass file systems on XFS, you're pretty sweet. Uh, if you do that with some other ones, not so much. I mean, so XFS is what we recommend to the point where if you come along and say, I have got this bug on a non-XFS type thing, we'll look at you like you're an idiot, then go, okay, so why exactly did you not put it on XFS? But look, if it's a legit bug, we'll fix it, right? No, don't get me wrong, but we will give you a slight strange, <laughs> you know, look at the same time. Um, yeah, I think I've just said that, yeah? XFS strongly recommended. Uh, now, when glusterd runs, if you do a PSEF on your server that you've got Gluster installed on, you'll see a daemon being glusterd, and this is sort of like the control mechanism. It, it runs everything. If you don't have one of these running on your Gluster server, something is wrong. So, um, now from a CentOS, let's say a CentOS 6 perspective, uh, seeing as it uses uh, check config and stuff still, you'll see like there's a glusterd service that needs to be on. So, you know, like in a check config, glusterd, turn it on type thing, you're all good. Uh, Gluster FSD is a file system service. So for each one of these Gluster volumes that you've got set up, you'll have a Gluster FSD process. So if you've created a Gluster volume from all these different bricks and you've started Gluster up, something is tragically wrong if you don't have a Gluster FSD process. There's a bunch of log files under var log Gluster that you can go and take a look there. Um, Gluster is one of these things that it is sometimes too verbose in its logs and you have to really get good with your grepping to figure out what's going on where. Uh, if anyone's used libvirt, it has the same problem as libvirt, which does exactly that same thing. Uh, too many log files sometimes. Um, it's, yeah, so there's one process for each Gluster FSD brick. So if you've got two volumes set up, you'll have two of these Gluster FSD processes. Um, yeah, it's pretty much. Yeah. As well, this sound, might sound a bit strange, but um, there's also a Gluster FS process. So it's all it's Gluster D, Gluster FSD, and Gluster FS. Gluster has an NFS server inbuilt. It's an NFS v3 server. So if you've got software that uses NFS v3, I think like ESXi, like vSphere uses it, ESX, uh, uses NFS v3. Um, Lots of things use NFS v3. Gluster's got one inbuilt. You know, so you start up your volume and you'll have an NFS server listening you can connect to and do stuff with. Uh, it's really useful for some stuff. Um, the normal way that Gluster is communicated to is via Fuse, which is like a adapted file system layer. It's good for fast file system development and to add features. We've got a Gluster command line client, so you can mount stuff from the, the command line, like mount from this Gluster server to a mount point on your server. That uses Fuse to do so. Fuse isn't the fastest thing in the world. Um, Ceph has the same problem. You know, Ceph has got a fast, fast file system, but they use Fuse for the mounting. We've got the, you know, fairly fast file system, and we use Fuse for the mounting. So if both of us have this problem with using Fuse. It's good for development, but the speed out of this thing is, it, it, is, it does slow things down. But it works. Um, we are doing a lot of work around removing Fuse from our staff. So some of the pieces of the, the newest release of Gluster have been re-engineered without a Fuse component and they're much faster. Uh, this isn't one of them. This is going to be like a hard challenge for us to, to do So in the future. So does anyone here use QEMU at all? No? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, a virtu um, like a KVM QEMU virtualization type of thing. Um, for anybody that's into things like OpenStack or virtualization or KVM, these sorts of stuff, it used to always use Fuse to access block storage. Like now we've got it using the different approach, direct sort of stuff, and it's much faster. But seeing as no one in the, the room really put their hand up, not important here. Um, yeah, so there is a Gluster uh, CLI. It's like a normal command line sort of thing. You know, you Gluster space some command and it will go and manipulate your volumes as you tell it to do. We will see more examples of that later on, actual examples, and all good. And I'm 21 minutes into my talk. I need to hurry up. Um, OK, so probably the best way to do this is go for the pictures. Picture. So OK, there's a few pictures in here. 
this is like a crappy picture though, you know. Um, this is a cut and paste thing, right? <laughs> so, okay, yeah, I don't like this picture. It's way too complex. So as you can see, the full stack of a Gluster system is a complex piece of engineering. You know, you go, it's like it's going from your, your actual physical hardware right up to what you actually see. I think I've described that anyway. Everyone is here's a sysadmin. They know there's going to be a bunch of bits involved. So let's move on. Yeah, okay, cut and paste. <laughs> like, you know, I, I like, you know, simple graphics, right? But when I cut and paste stuff, you know, time. Anyway, so scaling out. So with Cluster, as I was saying before, if you're finding that your performance of a particular thing is starting to get dodgy and like your clients aren't getting throughput enough, um, video files is a sweet spot of Gluster. Gluster likes small amounts of files, but very big ones. So um, this building's ITV, but I don't know how many ITV people are here, but for anyone that's in the whole ITV thing, just think, Gluster plus video is good combination, okay? Just, <laughs> just, just a thought. Um, if you find that your throughput isn't where you need it to be, you can add more nodes and you balance out the storage so that the storage that was spread on those servers, you say rebalance and it will spread it out onto the further nodes. So it will like add extra replicas and stuff. What happens at that point is that those new servers that you've added start sending data as well when your clients request it. So it's, it's pretty much just you know adding throughput that way. Does this make sense? Okay, am I being too slow, too fast or anything? Sweet, no, all good, okay. People are smiling, so either I'm either being stupid or I'm, all, I'm actually okay, yeah? <laughs> so, my fly's not open, no, no, it's, good. it's all good. Um, yes. With glu yeah, cluster logos, an ant, you know, super colony. Um, to, yeah, so scaling out, when you add nodes, adds them to the pool, you add file systems as new bricks. So on any one of the nodes, if you start running out of storage space on individual nodes, you can just add more bricks and add them to it. So you can expand volumes by adding more bricks. Uh, it's all live. You don't have to like shut down servers or do anything. The whole point of a thing like a distributed file system is it's all online the whole time. You don't need to do an outage for upgrading this, adding nodes or anything. It's just like, yeah, it's all good. No stress. Um, Look, if, if you are extremely unwise with the command set that you run, you can do stuff like you normally do on a server. You can nuke a server accidentally, and it's not good. You can shut down a server accidentally, it's not good, but Gluster will tolerate that. If you turn off the Gluster command, of course it's going to shut down. So <laughs> it's like, you know, so, you know, thought is required, but it's not super dangerous, you know, it's, it's mostly pretty cool. Um, yeah, okay. Things to not do for the next presentation, graphics. <laughs> so, so under the hood, we have an algorithm called the Elastic Hash algorithm. This is a special algorithm that we use to calculate where files are on what servers. So instead of the central metadata so, sort of server that like things like Lustre and stuff have, which have their own approach approaches for like trying to break that data up into different things, we just use a you know. An, an algorithm that says basically, so what's the name of the file? Yep, cool. Sweet, okay, it's gonna be on server three. Just, just think of it like a hash, and then how many servers have you gotten done? You know, and it, it does it that way. That is the simplified explanation, because if you add more servers, then it, you know, but as it, you know, that's roughly how it works. So it just has an algorithm, and it just figures out where it is, and goes to the correct server automatically. So it doesn't have this whole metadata server becoming a bottleneck, it works pretty well. Um, there are, you know, special things to make that better. So when you add new servers, it gets it all right. Now, this is a, a better look at this translator thing. When you add a new volume, like you create your volume, like create volume Justin, out of server A, server B, server C, and each of the different disks, these are potential translators that can be used. And these are actually the default ones, I think, uh, so we've got like a storage POSIX translator. So that actually goes, this is what provides your POSIX semantics. If you didn't have this translator in, all the others would be there, would access stuff. But when things try to access it, it wouldn't know the POSIX bit. So each translator does something specific, like features locks. So it actually does file locking. You can get rid of that if you don't want file locking. And there are places that don't have a use for file locking. It just slows things down. So 
This is where being able to customise what goes where is super useful. Um, <coughs> debug IO stats. By default it's in there, but disabled. So you can just change an option in the translator and it's enabled without having to rechange the whole volume files or whatever. Um, we've got read ahead, prefetching, things that just help for certain, you know, hard disk versus SSDs. With a hard disk, because it's rotational, um, read ahead is good. So as it does a read around the disk, it picks up the next couple of sectors or next files. Useful. SSDs, not so useful, just get rid of it, you know, it's as it is. Various types of caching. So the point is we've got a fair stack of translators that work out of the box pretty well. Every place is different, different hardware, different needs, so you adjust them as you need. Like you turn off, for example, the quick read one, for example, if you're using SSDs. Or if you're using some other technology, you turn on various things to optimize various things. It's, the defaults work pretty well, but again, as you drill into things and you learn more about it, you go, oh, we could try that out. You know? and, and like most places, if you set it up and you run it and it works well enough, don't need to look at it again. It's only when you start going, well, we might want to get better performance out of this that you start looking at some of the things like turning on reading or adding new servers and stuff. For most places, it just works well enough. Different volume types. When I was saying before that you have your volume and it has the bricks and there's different translators that control where your data goes. <coughs> With pictures, this is a there are a few basic fundamental brick types. Uh, sorry, a few fundamental volume types. I'll explain. They're all pretty self-evident. Uh, you guys would all be familiar with RAID levels, yeah? Like, you know, RAID 0, 1, 10, 5, you know, 2 and 3 if you're into you know, unusual stuff. Um, you know, so a distributed volume is one where you've got a volume and you can have multiple bricks, like brick here, brick here, brick here on different servers. When you write a file to the volume, it gets each file goes to its own complete brick on its own individual server. So there's no replication, it's all distributed. So what that means is you've got no redundancy and if any of the servers in your set drop a brick or drop, your volume's fucked, basically. <laughs> it's like, you know, because um, it's spread across like one, the, each file goes to its own individual thing. This is actually useful for some stuff because if you've got a thousand files, you'd have 250 of them on each server. So if you go to read a whole bunch of files at once, you've got four servers sending all, you know, a quarter of them each. Now, you, now if you can scale that out. It's like you've got a hundred servers doing this. It gets really fast, you know, but you have no redundancy. So if something goes really wrong, you're in trouble, you know, so you, you don't do this for stuff that's important. Um, it's similar to RAID 0, where you don't have any redundancy and stuff is spread around. Um, yeah, disk failure, bad, very bad. Yeah, what happens is this, right? Yeah, when you try and get a whole bunch of files, what happens is, in that particular scenario, three quarters of them you'd get. The, the one quarter would go, eh, you know, that's, you know. Um, and the weird thing is, which is an unexpected thing is some of those files will be in the middle of uh, in directory in the middle of directories so you can have a directory with 40 files in it and some of those files won't come back and the rest will so it gets to really weird failure scenarios when you're going what the hell is going on here i can, can't get to this file but i can get to this one this is where you have you, you start layering them so if you want to do the distributed thing sure but it's better to um also have stuff like a replicated volume so that if Yep, sorry, yeah. <sighs> Fucking Fedora. <laughs> so, like I said, I communicate with my hands, right? <laughs> so, and here's like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I don't normally run Fedora on this, but I was told, you know. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so, yeah, I've got no choice. So now I have to talk with my hands, right? Okay, so you've got, for example, a... Hey, the stream's going to be interesting now, isn't it? Yeah. Mark, yeah. the stream's dead now, yeah? Yeah, okay. Great. <laughs> the stream is basically you standing in front of a white screen. If, can we, if we can kill that, well, I can do that, <laughs> you know? Um, so, with, as we were saying there, you've got like RAID 0, which is this, the equivalent where you have files spread across different servers. 
the better way to do stuff is via replication. So you have, if you know, you have a replica where you write one file to the volume and it gets spread in multiple different places. Standard everyday replication like RAID 1, if anyone, you know, everyone's familiar with RAID. So you write a file to the volume, it goes on two different servers. If you've got two servers, any one of those servers dies, you can get it from the other one. Yeah, cool. I'm having to sort of like, it's sort of in the eyes type of thing. Hey, look, I, you know, I said I'd do the talk. We will go on. <laughs> so, talks are about communicating knowledge, not about watching friggin' spreadsheets or PowerPoints, you know. Yeah, so, so replicas, if anything dies, you've got another replica. Gluster's volume will just give it to you. You don't need to get worried about it. As sysadmins, we want to worry about it because we want to know something has gone very badly wrong. We want to go and replace that. From a user's perspective, though, they won't notice the difference. It's, it's, it just does it. Uh, so when you do a gluster volume create, you do this from the command line. It's like gluster, um, now I'm trying to remember, gluster volume create, foobar being the volume name, replica one, replica two, replica three, because you can say how many replicas that you want depending upon what servers that you want. And then you just say the volumes, like server A, mount point foobar, Server A, mount bar, foobar 2, if you've got two bricks on that server. Uh, server B, foobar, foobar 2, and so on. You assemble the volume, and it uses the defaults. So if, when we say replica 2, it will go, oh, I know that to put together this default translator stack for replicas, for two replicas, if you've got a two replica setup, you can combine them. So for example, you have a replica 2, which is two replica servers, and you, it's, you can make it so they're distributed. So you can this is where I do need pictures, right? <laughs> so, um, so you can have like the distributed translator that distributes things across all servers, but then you can s combine that with the re with the replica. So it's like cluster add, you know, volume, no, cluster create, cluster volume create, you know, my volume name, replica to distributed to. And what that will do is across all your servers, it will make two copies of them and distribute all the files across. So when your file gets written to anywhere in the volume, it gets written to everything that you've defined in two different places. Um, it sounds better when I've got a picture and I can actually show you which volumes of data is, but there, there is a limit to what I can do with air and, you know, guitar anyway. Um, <laughs> so, you know. Now, the point here, though, is really that you can control where your data goes, how many replicas that you've got, and how distributed it is. These are all tunable knobs to control the throughput. So, so you're controlling redundancy and throughput. So if you need to have more throughput, you add more servers because it gives more throughput. Uh, if you need to add more redundancy, you can say more replicas. Does this make sense? So this is all tunable stuff. Um, Gluster's best use cases are large files. So everyone's starting to look like they're falling asleep now. Sorry. <laughs> I talk too monotonously, I'm sorry everybody. Um, <laughs> does anyone here know what a smart house is? Yeah? Okay, you've got one on stage, I'll just say, you know. Um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. There's another one. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Gluster's specifically strong use cases are large files. Um, if you've got a bunch of video files or a bunch of backup files or uh, Anything that's really large file based, it's Gluster's sweet spot. It works very well with it. Gluster's horrible performance profile is small files. And this is common across almost every distributed file system type. The reason for this is, uh, across almost every distributed file system type that is trying to find a workaround for the metadata server is probably the way to do it. The reason for this is, if you've got a directory with say a thousand files in it, across 20 different nodes and it's all across all of them. What happens is when your client tries to write to them, where it sends the data depends upon the algorithm and stuff. So it'll send the data to some and the back end Gluster server distributes that out to like the rest of them, you know, tries to make sure it's all nicely hunky dory in the right spots. When you try and read from a server, the server that gets that goes, oh, okay, do I have the latest copy of the file and asks the rest of the servers to find out what the latest metadata time is. If you've got a directory with a thousand entries in it, times that by a thousand. It, it's, it's not smart enough to go, oh, I will ask the full directory contents. No, it goes, what's the first file name? A. 
all the servers. Hey, who's got the latest A? Next one, who's got the latest B? Who's got, yeah, so it's not good for things with small, tons of small files. Um, now, if you've got like an InfiniBand cluster and stuff, even with InfiniBand very, being very, very fast, that's still a shitload of overhead. So it's not great for that. However, if you've got a, large, a lot of large files, it knows where the data is and if, you know, it, it will go and find the metadata very quickly. And when you've got a bunch of large files, you're not often doing full directory lookups for everything. You know, you're often just pulling data, block data and, and chucking it forwards. And that is really Gluster's specific use case. Yeah. How large is large? Um, <coughs> good question. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I don't know of a good answer to that. Um, don't do for things like 1K files or news files or stuff like that. Large files, it'll take multi gigs at a time. Um, I don't know of anybody that uses files larger than a couple of terabytes, but you know, for, 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 for video type stuff, which we have a lot of places doing stuff with video, um, I know that like 60, 70 gig is pretty standard. Um, and from what I've heard, that's sort of normal. So, but you know, you know get, uh, ask me via you know, mailing, uh, mailing list, ask me via email address or whatever, and I'll go hassle some dudes and get the exact specifics out. So I can't do it right at the moment. <laughs> so, you know, um, look, you know, Justin needs to remember to bring his EU power adapter, <laughs> you know. Um, um, yeah, so that's the sort of the use cases for it. Some of the places that we've got good results from are NASA. When they did the whole Mars, NASA, Mars rover type of thing, and they pulled all, pulled all these Mars images from, from Mars and had to store them on the AWS cloud, that on the AWS cloud they were using Lustre storage on top of AWS and, and that's where they stored everything. You know, the Mars image rover things are apparently pretty large sort of files, you know, they're like, you know, 20, 20 meg each sort of stuff, not like your 2 or 3K, so. Yeah, that's, a, that's all good, and they had a bunch of them, and they just needed something they could whip up, chuck out there, and they didn't have to spend a, an absolute smeg load of time with the systems administrator going, F you know, it just sort of works and good enough. Um, Pandora Internet Radio is one of our other use cases. Um, you guys probably know Pandora Radio? Yes? No? Okay, some, some do, yeah. So that's a, it's like an internet broadcasting thing for just, just radio. They've got all their I don't know, MP3s or OGs or whatever that they broadcast in, and that's all stored on a cluster file system. Um, I don't know how many Gluster file systems or anything they use, and the last bits of the info that I had was on a laptop, which isn't working at the moment, <laughs> so I can't, can't look it up. But, you know, they use a large amount of storage. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, you know, I can't, you know, I can't show any Gluster commands at the moment. Um, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It can be, they, they, they offer different performance profiles. So um, because NFS has been around for so many years, various places have worked out good ways of doing caching, right? So for places that like to use Gluster but they have an amount of small file usage, you know, the, even though that's not the, the, ma the best use case for it, they still use it anyway, they try and do that through NFS because NFS does read caching really, really well. And so that's an example of very good use of NFS, where you would use NFS instead of the Gluster native thing, even though you're on Linux. Uh, other examples of macOS, people use, you know, um, Gluster itself only runs natively on uh, Linux. You know, and I keep telling the guys, dudes, we need to like broaden it, but it's not there yet, right? So if anyone's not on Linux that needs to access Gluster volumes, NFS is, the w is what you want to use. And it generally works pretty well. Um, Windows, we have just recently, uh, you guys would be aware of Samba, yeah? Being the, yep. Um, with the recent release of Gluster that came out and the, I think it's the upcoming release of Samba, we've sort of used that special very fast way of doing stuff. They've merged them together so that if you do a amount of a Samba volume from a Gluster backend storage thing, it doesn't use Fuse, it goes directly to the to Gloucester and it gets much higher performance. Uh, I do remember th th they w there were some initial benchmark figures and they looked really good. It was uh, the, rough, the rough ones, now I'm having to remember this so you can you hassle me for them later, but roughly the raw disk performance was something like, uh, I think it was 40 megasecond for this little use case on this guy's single thing. When he was using Fuse, I think it was like 17 megasecond, so you know, not great, but look, it works, it works. 
and when he was using the direct mount, I think it was like 38 megasecond or something like that. So significantly better than Fuse and not that far away from like native sort of stuff, which is where you want to be when you start doing this stuff, you know? So the more that we can convert to actually being the fast way and not using Fuse, the better. And so work is obviously, you know, continuing with that and more things will get done that way. Uh, we've actually added a, that faster way of doing stuff is actually an API that um, people developing their own applications can just call this API directly and that will access cluster behind it. We're trying to very much get into getting the whole development type of thing working very, very well with cluster because really cluster is, is really awesome things, these translators and these kinds of stuff that it's not like Ceph where it's inbuilt monolithic in the kernel and it, it's where it is and it's just real hard to add to. You can write translators in Python and do stuff, all sorts of stuff to customize the behavior. When I was showing before that it, there's a translator to do like, you know, read ahead and write behind and all sorts of stuff, um, one of the guys I know is just was complaining and saying, Jesus, you know, on Mac OS X, because when Mac OS X does stuff with NFS, it looks up a dot underscore then a file name for every file you go to access. It's just its way of doing stuff. It's, it keeps metadata in a specific file in a specific way. And negative lookups in a distributed file system where the file doesn't exist are a pain in the ass. Because what happens is, you know, your client says the server, hey, does this dot underscore file name file exist? And it will then check every server. Does you have one of those? And it's like a no. And it checks this every friggin' time that it goes to access this. Because, hey, has one been created yet? You know, it's a real pain in the friggin'. So distributed file systems don't like Mac OS X on NFX, right? So it was really pretty quickly, pretty quick using Python to write a Python translator to go, is this file name starting with dot underscore? Yes. <laughs> and just answer no, straight back, it's like, it's not here. And so it just wouldn't bother contacting any of the other things, you know? And that's not like a little, that's not like a, a long bit of code, that's Python. If anyone knows Python, it's not a lot of code, right? So it's, it's pretty easy to make, to whip up little customizations like that, shove them in the stack and voila, things go fast, you know? So it, it's useful for use cases when you go, hmm, um, so for example, let's say you're an evil corporation goes, we want to know, let's say you're a university, maybe not an evil corporation, right? And goes, we want to know when our users are copying around MP3s because, you know, they shouldn't be doing that. So if you have a translator written in Python that goes, does file name end in dot m slash MP3? No. <laughs> so, you know, you can just say, so you can't copy MP3s, can't create them. I mean, that's overkill. Or you, or you could have your Python script that notifies MPAA or whatever, you know. It's, I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> so, but the whole point is you can customize stuff very quickly with this translator thing. It's not like a monolithic kernel where you have to do extreme amounts of stuff, you know? It's like a, hmm, I've got an idea, let's whip that up quickly, chuck it in and see what happens. Th obviously the Python ones, when you do that, are not as fast executing as C ones. But I had, a, I had a Python one that I whipped up to just send stuff across the network, was firing 1600 times a second, fine. So it's not totally slow, right? Now you don't do that for a huge servers, but that was on my dinky little, just try this out, you know? So. If I wanted to performance optimize it, I could then go and write it in C and the rest of it, and it'd be a lot faster, but I didn't need to. <laughs> so, does that all make sense and stuff? Cool. Um, I think I'm pretty much out of talk from what I can remember. So, <laughs> it's like, how much time? Have I gone over time or under time? Or? So, any other questions? <laughs> yeah? Um, suppose I have three geographically disparate sites. Yep. Don't do that. Okay, that's a stupid thing to do. <laughs> it is unwise as hell, really unwise. Is um, it the geographical bit or the one brick It's the geographical bit. Um, Gluster has a, a, a mod, Gluster has a separate capability called geo-replication that can do this, but it doesn't act like a normal Gluster volume. It's a slave master asynchronous replication thing. Uh, Gluster works, Gluster is good as I inside a data center size. Gluster is good at maybe metropolitan if you've got very fast fiber links. Um, cluster is not good where you've got high latency between anything. Uh, distributed file systems in general suck when you've got you know, lots of latency between stuff. Because imagine an LSLA, you know, across a thousand files or recursive stuff and stuff's in like, you know, Hong Kong over here, Tokyo over there and friggin' Russia over there and each file goes, so who's got the latest file? It's, you, you don't get like a good result out of that if you're expecting speed. Can be done but it's not really what it's good for. Um, the, 
the the geo replication thing is is also think of it like you know master slave as well. So you can't have clients writing on both ends. They don't. It doesn't work that way. It's like uh, it's, think of it like a DR sort of thing is, is a better way to look at it. You know, you write the stuff here, it gets asynchronously replicated over here, and if at some point this site blows up, goes off the network, whatever, then over here, your data will be over here asynchronously. So you don't even, there's no even definite to point in time, it's not a synchronous thing. But you'll have most of your data. Okay, so, you know, within a couple of milliseconds or whatever the latency is. Cool. Okay, next questions? All good? I mean, sorry, is that, that that's all good? So, yeah, cool. Cool. This is obviously a, a, a um, file-based, as you say. Well, yes. Block-based. Yep. So um, the algorithm, the hashing algorithm, mm -hmm. um, if it's based purely on file names, that's obviously you're, 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 I, you're I'm not an expert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a statistical yeah. spike on, yeah. on one. Yep, 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 yep. I, I am not an expert on the algorithm, <laughs> and that was the simplified way as it's been explained to me. <laughs> okay, so. um, the question is, <laughs> yeah. are there different hashing algorithms for different... Um, I don't know. If you have um, fixed, if you have yeah, fixed yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I, know, I know what you mean. It's like if suddenly everybody wants abc.foo and it's only on one file, so only on one file server, then basically that server is going to get nuked. I, you know, mm. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, email me, and, you know, I, I will get the answer and find out. Well, I mean, it's a good question. I just haven't really thought of that before. <laughs> so, why yeah. would it be only on that file? Server? Because if you haven't planned out properly and you've only got your file on that one thing from a distributed, if you've got a distributor, a distributed file system with no replicas and you've got it only on one server, if you then get every client that you've got to access that one file server through the one file, that would have that behavior. Does that make sense? I was more concerned about where you've got multiple files. Obviously, where you have multiple files, but okay. your hashing algorithm is actually concentrating more on the particular yeah, server. Yeah, okay. So, so Maybe I'm explaining it badly, but okay, so let's say you've got a, so with the hashing algorithm that calculates which servers the file is on, now remember, I don't know the details of it, you know, elastic hashing algorithm that calculates what the servers the file is on. Um, I also know that we have a, like a metadata attribute that can contain an override, which is useful for when you're like editing out servers and stuff like that, right? But all I know is it calculates the right servers and it works. <laughs> so yeah, so I, I, I will have to find out. Um, if you've got things set up with enough replicas, you don't really have the spiking being that kind of a problem. But again, I could see cases where you might anyway, so I'd have to sort of think about it more. Yeah, I, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, any other questions that I can answer? Yep, sorry. <laughs> um, Deep Learning uh, Translator. Yep. How does it work? Do you just to file. I, I haven't. I haven't used it. I don't know. So again, I mean, really, uh, email me jclift at redhat.com or justin at postgresql.org. I, I will find this stuff out. You know, when people ask me questions, I'll go find it out and I'll pass it back to you. So that is a do that, and I will find out, and I'll probably include it in the next talk. So, uh, yeah. I used to ask him stuff to replicate stuff. Uh, uh, how does this work? Okay. The the, the way that. Gluster works is it tries to get the client to do as much work as possible, which is ask about how most people think of stuff. So I'll explain it this way so it gives a good understanding of it. When you've got a Linux client using the fuse mount and it goes and says, I want to mount this volume from your Gluster servers, you can pass it, you can point it at any of the servers and it, the 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 mount.glusterfs that we've written will go and communicate to that server and say, this is the volume I want to write, you want to get. In the first part of the exchange of communication, it, that server says, these are all the servers your volume is on, you know, that are part of the volume, and passes that to the client. So that's, that's the first part of the information exchange. That client will then open a TCP connection to all of the servers, and any time it wants a file, or to read a file, it will get it from the appropriate pieces, any time it writes a file, it will send the same piece of data to all of them, all of them at the same time. Now that can really take up client bandwidth, and isn't the only way it has to be done. But that's that's the default way of doing it. So it's the client sending the same data to all the servers. That's all good because realistically, most clients have got like gigabit Ethernet these days, and it's just you know good enough from a client's perspective. Um, on the back end there are a couple of different algorithms that run on the servers to check consistency of files and to actually update if things get out of sync. 
because you can't always rely on clients always getting it right. What happens if a server goes down out of the lot when this client's sending data and stuff like this? You know, these, these are legitimate on the fly things that happen. Um, so in the background on the servers, there's a, a self-healing process it's called. It looks at things like, you know, uh, metadata. There is one that can run through and actually you know, do check some blocks type stuff. There's various ways of checking. Uh, it's not rsync itself, which is which runs, except in the geo replication case. When we, when in the geo replication case, when we know there's a difference in the files, it runs rsync for that specific file. I mean, rsync works really well for specific things, you know. Like, um, so for the normal setup, if your client writes to a particular server, let's say it only writes to one out of twenty, that one will actually distribute it to the rest. But it's not synchronous. It just so that that will write to that particular one, and if there's something really drastically wrong with the rest of your cluster, for example, when they come up, then the others will be updated with that change, if that makes sense. Uh, anything else that tries to, re to read that file will get it from only the one with the, the, the fresh one. So that could be a resource spike on there, but that's a really unusual situation to happen and that kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah? Cool. I think I sort of explained that sort of like the, yeah. Uh, any other questions, thoughts, comments? Okay, break time, yeah? <laughs> so, cool. All good? KB? Yeah, next person. Yeah. Sweet. Sorry about the laptop. <laughs> yeah.